Well, we're going to spend a little bit of time and now a little well, well, less time just talking about who we are. Uh, and then we're going to uh, review the top five tips and tricks for today's session. Um, and uh, then we'll get into a live demo of the actual uh, tips and tricks that we're going to discuss in just a minute. Uh, a little bit about NetX. We're a legacy Altiris partner. Uh, we've been a partner of Altiris when it was legacy Altiris back in 2003 and then have since continued to grow with the uh and now have over 50 technical accreditations and we're ranked third out of 500 uh, resellers and partners. And that's a real big achievement for us because really speaks to who we are as an organization. We're an engineer on company first and then a reseller after. But as a reseller, besides anything traditional like uh, like software sales or helping you guys with renewals, uh, we, we can help you guys when you're just trying to understand what the product sets are, what you can do with them, uh, how to expand on your investment, how to really leverage your investment with some education or implementation servers. And a lot of what we are going to show you today is really uh, based on input that we receive as an education partner and some of the collateral that we put together for our customers in the class is where we're getting this, uh, this, this information from. And because we manufacture an appliance-based solution, uh, really we've had to really get on the forefront of, of making performance-based tweaks to the platform for many, many years to allow it to run on this single server architecture, which is uh, what we call our appliance. Um, so I, I discussed uh, that we were going to hand it off to a gentleman named Mark England, and Mark is with Alternative Solutions, and I know that in speaking to our customers, when they talk about their biggest challenge when it comes to managing their endpoints is uh, just maintaining all the drivers that you need to keep a hardware independent image up and maintained as, as, um, uh, as devices change. And even if you're buying the same model, I think what you'll, you'll learn when Mark takes the mic over uh, that you know even buying the same model workstation doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're getting the same driver. And Dell, HP, Acer, every one of them uh, have the, the the capability of switching a, a, a component on you without letting you know. So, uh, so for today, um, these are the five subjects that we're going to be uh, covering, and uh, we really focused our top five on part two on performance enhancing uh, tips. Uh, the, the feedback we got from the survey was overwhelming that people wanted to learn more about performance enhancing uh, tips because that's what, uh, that's kind of what the biggest challenge is. Sometimes the console can get slow and there's ways to optimize that. So a lot of these optimizations that we're going to talk to you today about are optimizations that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis because we put these optimizations on our customers' environments or in, without our using appliances. So these are uh, optimizations that we know full well. So Antoine will be able to demonstrate uh, how to implement these uh, these customizations and what kind of performance tweaks you can get out of them. Um, we're revisiting the app tools one, and you'll see that on there again for the folks that uh, were on part one. Uh, I think I think there was some more information that folks can garner from that, uh, and then and, and we did get some feedback that people wanted to know more about how the app tools work. Uh, and then one subject that we are, uh, we're going to talk to you guys is about troubleshooting and then processing SSEs, especially uh, after uh, uh, some queue backlogs and things like that. It's a better way to, to troubleshoot your SSEs. Uh, and um, as, it, as we did on the part one, we're going to, at the end of the, the presentation, there's going to be a brief survey. That survey is really important for uh, two reasons. A, it gives us the feedback to make sure that these are these are useful for you guys, and when you're joining, you're learning something important. And B, you guys are become eligible to win uh, uh, an iPod, an iPad uh, device uh, that we would draw at the beginning of each of the next series. So, um, for part one, we did draw a drawing, and hopefully this person is on with us today. Uh, but Brian Brown from Bright House Networks, if you're on, congratulations, you were the recipient of an iPad Mini. Uh, if you're not on, uh, then you know I will send an email. Hopefully, hopefully I'll see you on there, and you're excited right now, so I don't have to I don't have to worry about just sending you an email, and you can actually have some good reaction now. So, and then another bit of information. I'm not sure if anyone already has a mobile management agenda uh, on hand here, and I really try to keep these not salesy. But on the fifth, we're going to have a really informative webinar about mobile management suite from Semantic. And it's an overarching approach to, mobile, to managing your mobile devices, application, and securing those devices. Uh, and again, that is very little presentation and a lot of demo. And that's kind of the, the, the format we like to uh, uh, we like to use here at NetX. 
So with that, I'm going to hand the screen over to Antoine and have him show you guys some of these tips and tricks. Okay, uh, welcome everyone, and thank you, Angelo, for that introduction. So I'm gonna I'm gonna actually uh, run through the um, through my session in a, a little bit of a different order than what was presented. So please excuse me for that. I wanna I wanna get into the SE tools first, um, along with the the troubleshooting um, capabilities that you have with those, or the SSE tools. Excuse me. Um, note at the bottom of of this this particular slide, there is a knowledge base article. Um, that where you can actually go and and find these tools, and you'll notice as I go through um, the the individual tips and tricks, I will reference um, an article so that you can uh, garner more information uh, and and kind of see for yourself um, if this is this particular tip or trick or performance enhancement is uh, is something that that you can take advantage of in your particular environment. Um, also, uh, this session is uh, uh, being recorded and will be posted uh, later. But if uh, if you want to you know, get into uh, some of these items prior to the webinar being posted, by all means, uh, grab a screenshot of the of the the links at the bottom of the uh, of the slide so that uh, you can uh, you can have a reference to work from. So, the SSD tools basically give us the ability to um, get into some troubleshooting, to figure out exactly what's going on in our environment. Uh, and based off of some of the, the feedback we had, um, customers really want to know um, how to troubleshoot. You know, where do I start? Well, troubleshooting is an art. Uh, it takes a, a bit of luck um, along with uh, some of the background knowledge and the right tool set. And what Symantec has done is put together, um, you know, the right tool set. Now we can't control the luck portion of it, um, but we, we can uh, you know control the, the tools and, and provide you with the information that will make you successful. Um, some of the capabilities of the SSE tool would be as you see here, I can connect to my database and I can see what's running if I have um, uh, you know uh, database issues, if I have uh, processes running. Um, on my SQL Server that I need to pay attention to, things of that nature, if, especially if I'm getting a lot of deadlocks. Um, SQL is, is going to want to be the, one of the first places that you turn uh, when you go into your event logs and you're, you're seeing you know, deadlock upon deadlock upon deadlock. Um, what I hope to bring into the, uh, the next session uh, is uh, more uh, information around architecture and how to how to shape your your SQL server so that you can um, get the most out of uh, your implementation. Um, some of the other things, uh, and I put specific screenshots up here because these are some of the specific things that were that were asked. Um, is how do I find out what's going on with my unprocessed NSE, those notification server event files, um, those XML based files that are transmitted from your um, agent in the field on the machine to your server. Well, in some cases, those files may not process. And I have uh, you know, a, another um, portion of this that will talk about the queues and things of that nature, um, where these, these files actually end up and how to optimize those. So um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. But what you see here from within the NSE tool, uh, excuse me, the SSE tool, is I can go ahead and point to uh, let's get my highlighter here. I can go ahead and point to uh, where uh, the, the the file is that I want to examine. Um, and our <laughs> our demo environment, we 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 don't have much going on as far as um, broken NSE. So I was lucky to to be able to to connect to this one here. Um, but it it gives me some information as to you know the the scenario good, the resource good, uh, you know, where it actually came from. So I know that I'm having an issue with my uh, uh, Microsoft vulnerability assessment uh, or analysis component. And I can, you know, then start to go into my database and, and figure out what's going on. Or maybe I just need a, a reboot. Some of the other things I have is when this file actually uh, was created, um, things of that nature. So I'm going to go ahead and pop into the console, and we'll drive around the SSE tool a little bit more uh, to give you some idea of some of the other things that we can we can uh, actually do with that. So, okay. 
So I have um, showing now uh, my actual server, my um, Symantec uh, SMP 7.1 SP2. Um, and uh, I have my SSE tools actually loaded on here. And I, I've taken the liberty of, of basically queuing up some of the screens that I want to make sure that I show you from within the tool. But just as you saw in the screenshot, I have my, my log viewer. I can look at my IIS logs and things of that nature so that I can really um, understand exactly what's going on. And some of these uh, items here are redundant. Um, uh, if, if you take a look at the knowledge base article link um, to the tool, there's documentation uh, with that particular tool and it will actually um, you know, walk you through some of the things as to how to use it, etc. So this is again is more of an introduction, an overview uh, of that particular tool. But uh, one one of the items I had in the screenshot was my database health, and again I have the ability to go ahead and take a look to see my running processes. Uh, I can I can take a look to see exactly what's going on in SQL. Um, you know I can I can look at the store procedures that are uh, actually executing, etc. So it gives me a, a great deal of information here um, uh, to to start to track down what's happening. If I notice that you know I have you know multiple sleeping um, processes that that never wake or or I'm just consuming a lot of CPU, then you know I I would go directly there and I would I would uh, you know start to investigate that particular one. So you know in, in this particular instance, um, this one's not uh, an issue, but as I look at that one, this is the only one that's actually consuming uh, you know, a larger amount of CPU other than the other one down below. These are actually both uh, normal, uh, but I can go ahead and I can take a look and see what's going on. And I, this then allows me to provide more information to either tech support or um, should you contact uh, NetX for assistance. Um, you know, we have a, a better... Uh, a better idea of, of what's possibly going on. Some of the other things you want to look at uh, when we are troubleshooting, uh, if you are starting to experience uh, issues, um, and you'll, you'll notice when you start to experience issues because your console will start to slow down. You'll, you'll find out that if, if your performance is, uh, is not up to par, uh, and it was there before, um, then there's there's possibly something wrong. That's when we want to start uh, going in and, and, and looking around at things. And the first place we're going to start is, uh, or the first set of tools we're going to start with would be SSE tools. And just kind of poke around and see what, what jumps out. Um, one that we find in the field um, quite a bit uh, is the database size seems to grow um, tremendously. And that's that generally happens when, again, there's a problem. We've had customers who uh, would contact us and say, hey, I've run out of disk space. Um, so one of the things we want to try to do first is to let's let's see um, you know, what's using the most amount of disk space. And the culprit is generally going to be your database. And when you start to take a look at that database, you're going to want to take a look at your logs. And if, if they're not being committed and things of that nature, um, then we have problems. Something also you want to ensure that you do is, is to set up a maintenance plan. For those of you who've been around Alteris for a long time, you know, even from the 6.0 days, um, you know, maintenance plans have always been um, a, a recommendation, something that we need to ensure that we get into place. This maintenance plan not only consists of uh, backups, but also of the re-indexing, the defragment of indexes and things of that nature. Uh, so you want to go, uh, also make sure you have a maintenance plan set up. So one of the things that I would I would do if you contacted us for assistance is I would say you know open your SSE tools and this is you know before even connecting up uh, or or anything of that nature or even if you open a ticket with uh, with Symantec depending on the, the course you you want to take um, take a screenshot of here. So now I can see what uh, you know what your your database recovery method is set to whether you have auto shrink turned on and th that's one that will cause you um, some performance issues if you turn on auto shrink because basically your database is going to contract and expand on its own and that requires resources so it's going to pull that resources from somewhere it's going to basically pull it from the processing so you want to make sure that you know something like auto shrink is not enabled things of that nature. Um, you know, again, I will take a look at the database size and whether we have a maintenance plan, and then we'll 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 dig in deeper um, if I don't see any glaring issues there. But that's one of the first places I'm going to check. 
Notice on the performance tab here, there's, there's quite a bit of information available to you. Uh, much of this can really will only be made sense of by um, by a tech support person, but um, you know I I have uh, many different stats. I have weight stats here, so you know what um, what's actually uh, kicking off, um, how long it's it's waiting, uh, things of that nature. Uh, if I continue over, I can see this one I wanted to really see. Um, you may remember from the again, if you were in the six O days, there was a there was a, a, a query that we would run to see what your database table sizes are. Um, and in many cases, I would just take that query and I put it into the console, especially for those who didn't have direct access to SQL. Um, I would just stick it right there. Um, this tool will give that to you. Um, so again, quite a bit of information available to us. Uh, so here's our item size. Again, here's our, our table sizes, etc. cetera. Um, there's one other one. We took a look at that one, actually. Let's, let's make sure I got through every one that I wanted to see. Okay, here we are. So the the last one, and this this one actually feeds into um, you know one other topic that I'm going to talk about uh, you know later on in the, in the presentation. Um, I can basically uh, run this tool to look at or monitor my queues, and my queues are basically those those folders or those location or in this particular case in 7.1 SP2 that location where my um, NSE files end up, and they should get processed and, and then disappear. But if I notice here, um, I notice I have my database not ready exception. There's 67 of those. Well, um, database not ready could mean a lot of different things. It could have been a, a backup that was taking quite a bit um, of, of time to complete, or maybe that SQL server is under-resourced, or there was a, a connection drop between a database server, what have you. Whatever it was, the database was not ready. But I noticed that that I have 67 XML files in that folder um, uh, related to that particular issue. And I could go ahead and double click on those and I can actually get directly to the file. And I, can, I can scroll through and I can see, okay, well, I, many of these were from um, you know 2011, so I haven't had an issue in in, in the environment as far as database related, uh, uh, database connectivity related in, you know, in, in quite a while. So I'm happy with that. I'm not going to delete them. I'm going to keep them right there because it's uh, it's nice to, to show. And then there's the item uh, not found exception. I, again, I can go ahead and, and double click on that. And if I wanted to examine this more, um, you know, as opposed to actually opening the file, I could just go back and point to that particular um, location, that particular file location, and voila, there it is. So that's how this uh, up above relates to that particular file. So it opens it up, exams it for me, I can go and grab information from it, um, etc. Okay. So let's switch back to my, uh, my slide. Okay. Okay, so the, the next section, this is actually will be the remainder of my section um, of my presentation, would be the different performance tweaks. Um, and we did actually go through uh, custom application pools uh, in the, the last webinar. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about it or, or, or revisit it uh, as it were, but I, I encourage you if you did not um, attend or were not able to attend the previous webinar, if you go to the, the next website, um, I, where I go through and I actually create those uh, those custom app pools and things of that nature. Um, I, I think that would be very helpful. But as you notice here, again, I'm using my SSE tools, and, and what I'm attempting to do is relate the SSE tools uh, to you know, all parts of, of my particular presentation so that we can see different aspects of it. But uh, you'll notice here, I one of the things that, I again, I would ask, uh, as I'm uh, assisting a customer, uh, my team is assisting a customer uh, with troubleshooting is, okay, how are your app pools configured? So I can go ahead and just run this tool and uh, I can I can screenshot it or, or whatever the case is um, and get information related as it relates to each of the different uh, application pools. And these are all custom. The, the defaults would be, uh, as, it's, as it were, default uh, app pool and classic app pool. These others here, along with server appliance, server appliances will, will show up on every um, NetX appliance. We uh, isolate our application pools from the, the software 
um, and provide credentials and things of that nature to allow us to do some of the things that we, we do with that. So uh, for, for the new folks on the call, um, you know, I'll do a brief introduction to what, actually what is an app pool. And you know, this, this article, this is a, a Microsoft TechNet article, and I pulled this information right from there. Um, application pools is a group of URLs that are served by worker processes. So this, this, these worker processes, you know, will um, will recycle themselves uh, after a particular uh, amount of time, and they just basically do work. And we we have the ability, uh, the benefit of creating these application pools is because it will uh, improve server performance and as well as application performance. So. Um, what we have the ability to do is we can take specific applications that are related or specific processes within an application that are related uh, and, and and group those together. Maybe they all run on a particular um, a particular schedule or you know there's known conflicts between you know application one and application two that that type of thing. We can go ahead and and group those uh, together. Um, it also improves application availability. So if one portion of an application uh, fails, or and this is we're talking web applications uh, when we're talking application pools, um, it's not going to take down uh, the remainder or the remaining applications. So uh, for those of you who have, may have experienced some either performance issues or other type of issues within the console, you patch management may have may have. Uh, blown up or, or something of that nature. But the rest of the applications are continuing to run. Not to say that they won't take a hit. They will continue to run, um, but they, they, they will certainly take a hit. Um, so, But if we have the ability to go ahead and isolate those, then we can ensure uh, availability of, of those um, of those apps. And as well as uh, improve security. Uh, again, I can go ahead and assign uh, a username and password to run specific applications, specific web applications. And what this does for me is I don't have to give the entire web app, you know, domain admin rights, uh, for instance, or local administrator rights. I can have some that run under network services, some that run under system, uh, and some under uh, specific accounts. And again, uh, uh, with the, our NetX appliance, our our server appliance application pool runs under a specific account, and again, that allows us to um, to do some of the things within the semantic application that we need to do in order to make the uh, the appliance work the way that it does. Um, we can you can set this application pool up or these custom application pools up with a script. Now, I'm not going to uh, go through this entire portion again today. Again, go. Uh, I would encourage you to go back and take a look at the the webinar uh, that we did in the month of January, um, and if you wanted to see it in action. But it's actually pretty simple. It only takes a couple of minutes and just a few steps. If you go to this web link below, and this is actually out there on Connect, you can get this script. And what this script does for you is basically you open a command prompt, you paste it in there, and it will go ahead and run. And it will create the application pools for you. And it will go ahead and configure them uh, appropriately as well as add in the appropriate application. So for instance, here is the application pool for the activity center. And within the semantic management platform, the, um, the, the, the portion of the console that looks like Outlook, that's known as the activity center. Uh, what we're doing here is we're isolating the activity center from uh, from other uh, applications and, and application pools so that we can get a better response. So what is happening here is we're going to create this application pool and name it App Center. Uh, excuse me, App Center. Activity Center. Thinking of another product. Uh, we're going to go ahead and configure it to be classic. So with application pools, you have either classic or integrated. Um, we, we must use the classic application pools. And then we're going to go ahead and add in the actual application. So the application or the URL to that application is right here. So that's how we basically break apart what's going on in this particular script. It's really simple. You can do it manually or you can go ahead and run the script. Uh, now, in the webinar that, that we did in January, you'll notice that I had some uh, application pools there already. And I just ran the script, and it just created the other ones. 
Um, so I, you know, I don't have to uh, have a clean slate to start. I can. Uh, this can be an existing SMP. Uh, I can go ahead and run this. And we have uh, we've been creating custom application pools with the Netix appliance for years. Um, you know, way before this particular article came out. So there, there are literally hundreds of uh, implementations of custom application pools. Um, upgrades and things of that nature to the software um, won't break what you've done. Um, so what, what I would uh, suggest is, is prior to making any type of configuration changes to your system that you have uh, a, a good backup, a good and tested backup. Um, and optimally, if you have a lab environment, run it in the lab environment first prior to production. So the, the next performance tweak um, we'll talk about is increasing the, um, the item cache size. And here's the article down below, or the, the link to the URL, to the tech, uh, excuse me, the uh, knowledge base article. Okay. Um, so that, again, you can, you can gather more information. Um, we're not, uh, we don't put anything out there that uh, that the manufacturer um, would say no. You 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 can't uh, you can't do that. We're not going to support it. Um, so we, we do everything in a supported fashion. Um, but but again, uh, with the experience that we have in the field with our field engineers, what we have on the development side, um, you know, we have a lot more insight uh, to to some of these these things. So we we're, we're able to to put them together and hopefully um, allow you to. Um, Hopefully they will help you as well. Um, but anyway, um, by increasing our application, uh, our item cache size, basically uh, what we're doing again is we are going to increase performance. Now, where, where do we do that? We increase the um, item cache size using our core settings .config file. Now that that config file basically controls. You know all of these background things that you don't see in the console. I mean, there's some some console related configuration items in there, but others such as item cache size, queue sizes, and things of that nature are located in that uh, that core settings.config file. And again, um, just a disclaimer: uh, prior to making any configuration changes there, uh, you should have a, a good backup at least of that file. Um, always ensure that you have a, a recent backup of your database. And optimally, if you have a lab environment, want to go ahead and configure uh, the lab environment first. Okay. So, uh, what happens though uh, when we are, uh, you know, when item cache sizes are, are too small for our particular environment? Well, we run the risk of uh, cache flooding. Okay. And you'll you'll see uh, error messages in your um, in your log viewer um, related to caching or uh, cache size needs to be increased, things of that nature. Um, now, in some cases, you may not actually see um, uh, warning messages in the log. So you, we want to ensure that, A, we're checking the logs on a regular basis, and we're not ignoring warnings. That's one of the things that I've found that, that happens most often. The system tells us, in many cases, what's going on. Um, we, we're just uh, either overlooking them or completely ignoring them. So again, um, in the absence of warning messages, it doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, cache sizes are appropriate for your particular environment. Again, this is, this is right from the article. I, I chuckle a little bit when I, when I read that one. So um, then how do I know what sizes these things should be? I can't just pull a number out of the air. I don't know if it's going to have a positive or a negative impact. In some cases, you can make a change to a configuration setting that did not need to be changed, and have a, a negative impact. Uh, you know, by you know, again, it's going to reduce um, performance as opposed to increasing performance. So we want to be careful. Uh, we want to ensure that we have um, you know good references and, and things to go by before we start to make these changes. So again, taking advantage of the um, of the SSD tool. I am looking at performance, and in performance, I see, hey, in my demo environment, my item cache sizes should uh, should be increased. So, as well as it gives me the the um, parameters that I should increase them to. So these are defaults here. Uh, most of what we have, as far as uh, core config in our demo environment, is all default. So these are all default configurations. I didn't change them just for the slide. Um, 
it also tells me again where I can find my co uh, course settings file and the actual lines that I can I can go ahead and change it. So what I'll do is I'll go to this URL, uh, this this link to that file, and I find this thing. Okay, and I go in and I start typing, and I if my phone rings or whatever the case is, and I forget where I am, or I hit the space bar, if, especially if you're a syntax person such as myself, where I leave out a space or put a space in the wrong place, I spend quite a bit of time chasing down my own syntax errors. Um, so I would stay away from this whenever I can. Although if it's absolutely necessary, I can go ahead and make those changes again. Um, you may note, um, you may notice some of the uh, values um, uh, that are configurable in this, right in this file that you would you would see in the console, such as here's my uh, database server name. There's there's a, the actual uh, reporting uh, timeout whether the uh, the server is actually processing and things of that nature. Whoops, sorry. Um, so if I want to stay away from this, then um, what's a, what's a better way of actually configuring uh, my core settings file? Well, there is this tool that's been around for a very long time. It's called the NS Configurator. And here is where you can get a reference on the NS Configurator. I would uh, advise you to go and grab this, pull it down, um, save it for later. If you're not going to make any changes now, there's some good information in there. Um, it has a little search window. I can, I, I, in this particular case, I'm interested in um, specific items, um, security cache size, uh, uh, etc. Um, I just put in cache size, and it brings up all of the, the different. Um, cash size related items and I can go ahead and make those changes at that point. So I would rather use this tool than to go and use Notepad and do this. Unless I want to impress my friends and have some complex looking stuff on my screen, uh, I'm going to go in here. Okay. So let's pop into the console. Let's take a quick look around the uh, NS configurator. Okay. So I'll go ahead and minimize these guys. And I didn't queue that one up, so let me just uh, open the folder here. And so, um, <clears throat> along with the NS configurator, there's, there's several other things that are behind the scenes that we may not be familiar with. And uh, again, just to uh, just to backtrack just a tad, uh, if I go into my my SSC tools, um, you know, you I'll, I'll see you know NS NS diagnostics and and things of that nature. And I think there's here we are. There, on the shortcuts tab, there's some some other tools such as the the log viewer. I can get to my NS configurator right here. There's my SQL profiler. Um, there's some sys internal uh, tools that are that are uh, you know pretty important to um, that help you f figure out what's going on. Um, things such as Wireshark if you, you're troubleshooting communication issues, uh, things of that nature. Um, there's a license removal tool here as well. And the uh, reason why I want to point this out, and it wasn't a, it's not a part of my my presentation, so to speak, but I want to uh, point out an issue that happens quite a bit. If you're going through an evaluation um, period um, and your, your evaluation license is expired, maybe you're, um, you you contact either NetX or your um, Symantec sales rep and say, "Hey, you know, uh, uh, Angelo, I, I I want to you know extend my trial." Well, you can't install trial licenses over trial licenses. You have to remove the original trial licenses. So. Um, basically launch your license removal tool and highlight the licenses and, and delete them uh, as opposed to where previously you, you had to go and create a certificate um, uh, MMC and, and do it that way but uh, I digress so in my NS configurator which is located right here I'll go ahead and launch that you know again I have the ability to go ahead and I can open any one of these. I'll just choose one, my database server, for instance. So that's that's my database server name. I'd much rather edit that right here than in that uh, that file. Um, if I'm looking for my cache size, which uh, <clears throat> which is the topic, and I click search, and I go ahead and one of the ones that we would uh, we would change would be. Um, the security cache size. So th th my default value is there. I can go ahead and, and put in, uh, based off the knowledge base article, what is uh, 
what is recommended. Or if I, I think I've goofed or whatever the case is, I can go ahead and, and hit the restore default. So that, you know, several other advantages um, over using this particular tool than going into the, the text file. You can always just make a backup of your text file to it, I guess. <clears throat> so so the, the next um, topic, you know, still, still related to performance, is, is a very common issue, and in this particular um, uh, issue here, or this particular topic, um, we we've noticed several times that uh, you know customers will uh, will give us a buzz and say, hey, my my server's running slow, or my inventory information is not showing up, or something. Um, and what what we generally find out is that there are queue um, queue was full uh, warning messages that have been. Uh, ignored. So, uh, in order to to uh, you know stop this before it happens, um, especially since this is often ignored, as as a Altiris administrator, um, you want to make it part of your daily checks. Uh, you know, you're checking your your um, log files, you're checking your um, uh, your your Windows logs, you're checking your IIS logs. You want to also go ahead and check your queues, and you can do that again by using the SSC tool, which I, I demonstrated. Will show you, you know, how many uh, files you have in in which queue. Um, we've we've run into uh, we've come to uh, customers uh, and and found that they had I have thousands, but I should say tens of thousands. I mean, we had a customer who had about thirty five thousand unprocessed NSEs just sitting there, and the server is just churning on those. Um, so you know, it's if this is gone unnoticed, it could uh, it could back up uh, pretty big and cause major uh, server performance hits. Um, so again, when customers call for help, they're generally saying, "Hey, I, I, you know, my server's running slow, or I'm not getting my inventory information, or what have you." If you start to notice some of those things, go check your queues, see what's going on there. Um, check your log. If you see in blue, and that's why I have this in blue because it will be a warning message in your log. Um, go check your queue and you, uh, your, your um, event log for uh, Alteris, and you'll notice something that looks very similar to this. And there is the actual, um, you know, there's the the red herring right there. Okay. So if I see that, then I notice I know that I have a problem. So what I need to do, and that came up too quickly. So what I need to do is go ahead and stop my Altair services, and those are the services listed there. Uh, and this, all of this is referenced in the knowledge base article down below. Which we'll also stop IIS, and I will go ahead and I will I will cut or move those uh, unprocessed NSCs into a temp folder. It could be anywhere on the root C on the desktop, wherever. Um, you know, it could take a while. Although they're small, little small XML files, uh, you know, depending on the, the number, you want to, you know, just give yourself some time and understand that that's going to be move. That's going to to have to move. And then you're going to go ahead and increase your queue size. And queue sizes can uh, can take up to uh, from two to four uh, gig of disk space of hard disk space. Okay. So if you are a very large customer, you might want to consider go ahead and setting that for four gig. Then you want to go ahead and determine, um, you know, how many threads are, are are being processed at any one time. So in in this particular case, well, well, here's the query down below, and again, that can be found in that article. Um, you should uh, be processing up to ten threads at a time. Now, our I was going to to show that live, but our demo environment is pretty idle, so it just sits there at zero. Um, so I, not really much to show you there. So, but when I, when I when I talk about increasing those those queue sizes, uh, what would be the values that I would need to increase them to? I would go ahead and, and uh, you know pay attention to this particular slide uh, in particular because it does have the values here. Um, again, using my NS configurator, and I won't pop into the console for this. Uh, we just saw the NS configurator. There are certain queues that we want to uh, manipulate. Others are are still there. The references to them are there, but they um, they are inactive or um, you know, are no, lo no longer have an impact on the on the system. And in some cases, again, uh, changing those uh, could uh, give you a, a negative result. Um, again, the article is down below. 
this is this is a, a, a huge processor um, uh, alleviator, process uh, uh, impact alleviator uh, uh, for this particular uh, setting here. Um, again, especially for those customers who have a large number of clients, they find that uh, queue, queues are backing up and nothing's processing. Um, by going through this, this process here, and we've, we've done it uh, numerous times, it, it will go ahead and alleviate that problem. Also, uh, in the 7.1 SP2 uh, version of the product that, that ships today, um, we no longer have to run uh, reports or go into the, um, the the event queue folders themselves and actually look to see what's in there. Uh, or uh, there's an actual table now uh, called event queue, and you can do a select asterisk from uh, event queue and, and see exactly what's in there. But as a part of this particular process, um, we're going to go ahead and truncate what's in the event queue. And the reason why uh, is because smaller messages get written directly to the database now, whereas before everything went into the folder structure. Uh, and there is a wonderful article. Let me back up here. No, actually, it's not in this particular one. It's in the, the next slide. Um, but there's a wonderful article that uh, that that speaks to the, the different queues, their sizes, and what they are um, what they're used for, as well as uh, for those who've been around for a while. You know the actual NSC flow. Once we've gone through and truncated our um, database tables, we'll go ahead and then restart the server. Although uh, restarting the, the services that we stopped will generally do it. I'm a restart server type guy. Uh, I'll restart it. It refreshes everything, and then you know I'll take the extra time just to allow it happen because many times it has to has to happen anyway. Then you can go ahead and delete those NSCs that we saved off, or you can reprocess them uh, depending on, you know, if they're very, very recent, um, just go ahead and reprocess them. If they're from, you know, two years ago and you just, you know, got to the point where you needed to look in there or decide to look in there, then, you know, it's a good chance that, um, that they're no longer important. Um, you know, use whatever works for your particular environment. And then uh, what you also want to do is uh, set up your antivirus to um, exclude your event queue directory um, from, from active or real-time scans. That, that's going to uh, uh, take a tremendous load off of the server as well. Okay. Uh, the next performance tweak is a little known one. Uh, it's a, a, a performance tweak within the .NET uh, machine.config file. Um, it's basically... Uh, to you know, turn off the generate publisher evidence uh, uh, function, and there's a knowledge-based article down below uh, from Microsoft that actually describes what's going on. But what this thing does is let me just get my highlighter out here. Um, what it does, what it does, is it basically checks to see is there evidence of code access security. Okay, and we'll we'll see that. I'll show you where it's referenced. You'll you'll see a CLR reference actually. Okay. Um, however, by default, most applications do not need publisher evidence, and Microsoft also recommends um, that you turn off that um, that process to improve startup performance of your web applications, especially. If you are not, uh, you know, if your web application does not use this functionality, so then what's the, the next question is then um, how do I know I'm supposed to turn it off with Symantec? Well, if you go to this this particular Symantec article here, it states specifically that none of the applications that comprise the Symantec management platform make use of Authenticode assembly signing evidence, so it's safe to turn it off. So how do I do it? Well, you have two ways of, of actually doing that. You can manually do it by going into this machine.config file and just simply turn it off and either re, uh, reset an IIS or reboot the server. Um, again, same disclaimer. I won't repeat it, uh, but same disclaimer uh, applies. Uh, and there's the again, there's the same Microsoft article. It, it points that out. The second way of doing that is during your install with the Symantec uh, installation manager. So, and, and we generally don't pay much attention to um, the green check marks, uh, and that's how it becomes overlooked. 
Uh, but let me grab my highlighter here. So there's C uh, CRL. So as long as I have access to the internet, this is going to come up green. And that's the way most of us actually build our servers. When we come on site, we say, you know, give us server network access. All that stuff is already configured. Um, so this particular thing never throws up a red flag. And, and notice this also, see where my scroll bar is? It's all the way at the bottom. If I scroll up to the top, then I see where I, I need those other uh, prerequisites. So um, how, do I, how then do I go ahead and, and, and get that using the SIM? get it to the point where I can fix it. Well, I simply disconnect my network card. Um, it's, it'll be a little tough to do this if I'm doing this remotely, but in a VM, you just go to the system tray, disconnect it, and, and you're good to go. That Then you, you check your installation uh, readiness again, and it will come up with this message, a uh, warning, and now it's, it, you know, it's up here with everything else. So I can go ahead and click the, the link that will go ahead and fix that for me automatically and what that when I fix it automatically it's basically just going to go ahead and change that uh, that true to false. Uh, if I click the link below it uh, to check for additional information um, then it'll it'll go ahead and provide that additional information for me. Um, after last month's webinar, we had such great response, we decided to bring on one of our senior development um, and deployment engineers, Mark England, and he's been involved in literally hundreds and hundreds of deployment initiatives, and he's one of the foremost experts in driver management. So he's going to take a few seconds to talk about some of the, the main driver issues that we've seen um, through through all of the clients that we've worked with and, and how Deploy Expert can remediate those issues. So, Mark. Yes, thank you, Rachel. Um, so, during our last, uh, during the last webinar, we went over some of the basics of Deploy Expert and how it functions, that sort of thing. It is a standalone application that works with the Semantic Management Platform. Um, today, we're going to go into some more depth into driver management and dealing with a lot of troublesome drivers that we commonly see in a lot of environments. Um, so real briefly, I'm going to kind of refresh a couple concepts in Deploy Expert so that everyone's on the same page. Um, you are seeing the Deploy Expert console here, and on, on the first page here is the, uh, the analysis. Um, and basically, we take the systems from the, uh, from the semantic management console and we analyze them. We have a custom inventory and we create these into first, we break them down into models, and then further into what we call compatibility classes, which are actually discrete hardware platforms. So we're talking different device listings, you know, are making differences in classes. And so we're getting a very in-depth analysis um, down to, you know, things things that matter, chipsets and, and storage drivers and that sort of thing. Um, and so I just want to touch on that so everyone was on the same page with, when we're talking about between classes and models. Um, and today we really want to focus on the driver repository. Um, and so... Let me clear my search here. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, something we see very commonly on uh, certain Dells and uh, <clears throat> Lenovo's. And basically it manifests itself as uh, missing like PCI devices whenever you've done like a deployment. And you look at your device manager and you see those yellow like exclamation points on like something generic like a PCI interface or PCI device. A lot of times in those Dells and Lenovo's and occasionally HP's, what that's missing is actually something called the Intel Management Engine. And uh, it's actually an application that needs to be installed on these systems. So Deploy Expert can help you deliver that and target it to classes and models and all sorts of things. Um, so real quick, what we're seeing here is the driver repository and Deploy Expert. Um, in the top left panel is all of the drivers in the environment. Um, that's harvested, downloaded, and application drivers. So those are the three types that Deploy Expert handles. Um, and we'll get into those a little bit more here. But down at the bottom here are the classes that have been analyzed um, up in from platform analysis based on the inventory. And then the associated drivers in the right-hand panel here. Now, uh, some of the classes here have not been harvested due to see, and some of them have been. Um, and some of them have drivers for the Intel Management Engine interface, but what you really need is the application to avoid those problems in the actual device manager. So the way we can resolve that is uh, uh, basically what I've done was uh, I downloaded the Intel Management Interface uh, from the Internet. You can usually get it from the manufacturer. You can get it from Intel. And... Uh, 
I download it directly to my system and you just can add it here. Um, I've told it to copy files and subfolders and I'll give this a name like with a silent command line parameter and when you save it asks you which is the setup executable and you just hit OK and basically this is moving the files and adding it to the master driver library. So these get uh, replicated out with your package just like any other semantic package. Um, and once you have an application like this, it shows up back here in your driver repository. So at the bottom of this list, you can also filter this and say show only uh, applications. And basically, it's just sitting here, and you can associate it with any of your models here. This is a small lab environment, so there are a lot of options here. But a lot of times, I see this needed on Lenovo's. Um, you know, and most of those models will need that. And you can associate it with an entire model if it's supported, which usually the Intel management engine is uh, for an entire model. But you can also target it to a specific class. If you happen to know, oh, I just have this HP Pavilion that needs it, you can associate it with a selected class. And it'll just, it basically gets added. And during the next uh, Windows 7 deployment to that type of system, it is deployed and uh, installed during SysProp silently because we supplied the silent command line application. Um, the other one I wanted to touch on and for Windows 7 that I see a lot um, the application is needed for. Um, a lot of times on newer Dells um, when a deployment is finished you'll also see a missing driver for, for what usually ends up being like a USB 3.0 device. Um, and what it is is the Dell has basically designed this driver to require the Dell control point software. And so that's not necessarily something that's obvious. Um, and so I, I often see people have issues with that specific driver. But again, the way to get those USB 3.0 drivers to install on those Dells is you can go to Dell and download the Dell control point software and you can add it. Um, and this is, uh, you know, usually for like an Optiplex 980 or a later Optiplex like that um, and certain of the laptops. Um, for Dell, your silent command line is almost always slash S in this case. You can save this. Again, it asks. You say it's the setup.exe that will install it, and you hit OK. And again, now you have a new application that you can associate with. In this case, let's say all of my um, all of my Inspiron 1545s. And now, every time I deploy an Inspiron 1545 class-based or model-based, um, in either case, we will get that application. And you can see it's listed here. Um, <clears throat> And so those are a lot of the things in Windows 7 that we see. I see those very commonly almost all the, other, all the time. The other things um, in Windows 7 that I see that need applications or downloaded drivers, um, in, in Dells I see a lot of uh, free fall, like uh, the accelerometers and laptops. They're usually called ST Microelectronics accelerometers. And uh, those are ones you'll need to add an app, and you can use the same procedure to get those associated. Um, you see it with fingerprint readers and uh, other biometric stuff. Um, and uh, Bluetooth devices often, you know, they can install, but you need those apps to actually do any good. So uh, those are some of the big things. Um, the other one I wanted to mention is in Windows XP, um, for people still doing Windows XP uh, migrations, one of the big ones that almost everyone's very familiar with is uh, SoundMax drivers. Um, and uh, I've dealt with SoundMax drivers for many years, um, <laughs> and uh, they're kind of notorious for being difficult to install and basically the drivers are designed to not install without their application. So again this is a case where you need to go to the manufacturer and download those files to the server and then you can add them in here. Uh, and you just give this a, a nice specific name so that you can identify it. Um, you can give it a, in this case it's a slash s parameter for the file and install. Select the setup.exe, and now back in back on our driver he, here we have the application. Now the other thing here is that so the, we just associated the other two drivers directly. There's also the way in DX that you can replace the other SoundMax drivers that are already existence. Because right now, a lot of times when I see an XP installs, the SoundMax drivers are there and they can be harvested, but they do not fully install without the application. So what you can do is you can find the SoundMax by searching the driver library, and you may have multiple versions of this, but you can select each SoundMax integrated digital audio. Um, in this case, I happen to know it's just on my one Optiplex model. And you can forward the versions or the version or versions 
to the application. Um, and in this case, it's application eight right here. Um, and you hit OK. And now basically in every situation, like on this GX520 that you used to need driver 39, it has now been forwarded to driver eight. And so instead of trying to install that faulty driver that was that was uh, pulled from the system, it's actually just going to install the executable, and it's going to resolve that issue all over the environment. And so you may have a few different versions. Um, if you see those Soundmax on Dells and HPs, which they can be, but uh, you can really uh, bring those into a tight control into just a couple of applications to resolve that. Um, now those are probably the two biggest ones, and I mean those are probably the three biggest drivers. Um, and there are, of course, a handful of others that you may see, but you can use the two techniques that I've kind of outlined here to resolve most of those missing drivers um, and uh, failed devices when you deploy out, and you can get them resolved very quickly. So um, based on that, I'm going to hand it back to Rachel for a final statement. Thank you, Mark. Um, well, we really appreciate it again, and if you have any questions, feel free to check out our website. Dwayne Carlson will be able to answer any of those questions. Her email is up right now, and we'd love to hear from you. That's pretty much what we've got for today, and we look forward to the next webinar. Great, great. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, everyone, and we do apologize um, um, that uh, we've been having technical difficulties here. Uh, hopefully everyone found this content very useful, and we look forward to having everyone join us for the third part of our three-part series. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.